Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's seminar. We'll give it a few more minutes for, uh, for more people to join. I think people are still joining in. So we'll just uh, give a few more minutes. I think we'll start. Uh, so welcome to our second uh, seminar series on single cell sequencing and the human cell atlas. Uh, so I don't know how many of you joined for the for our first seminar, which happened last Thursday, uh, which was introduction to uh, the human cell atlas and the enormous things it can achieve. Uh, and uh, if you were listening in, you would have understood that the uh, potential is unlimited. So today we have three speakers. So, so this whole seminar series, we have four, uh, we have four days. Today is the second day. And today we have uh, three speakers, uh, really fantastic uh, people, uh, speakers who have a lot of expertise in this area. Uh, so I'll uh, introduce the three speakers. Uh, first one, first to go would be Laura Richardson. She's a technical specialist working in the Techman support group. She moved from her high throughput screening team to use her experience and knowledge to benefit the Techman lab. And next we have Rakesh Kapuge. He's an advanced research assistant working in our wet lab in uh, you know the Techman wet lab support since January 2022. He joined the team from the Microbiology Molecular Clinical Diagnostic Lab in Edinburgh's hospital. His work includes tissue processing and sequencing library preparation in the wet lab team. So it's nice to have somebody speaking on wet lab experiences as well. And then uh, the third speaker would be Shani Pereira. Uh, is a technical specialist working on the Human Cell Atlas project with the primary role of performing histology, spatial transcriptomics, and imaging uh, using cutting edge technology. So I'm pretty I'm personally very interested to look at, you know, uh, the spatial transcriptomics and, and how you do it on uh, histological slides. So we have a really uh, exciting lineup of talks. So I'll hand it over to Laura to go ahead, followed by Rakesh and Shani. Uh, thank you so much. The screen share working. Yeah. You're on mute, Laura. Okay, can you hear us now? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting us to talk. Um, we plan to give you uh, an introduction to single cell sequencing technologies. We um, would like to thank Kirsten for her overview. And then um, we share her same excitement about single cell work um, that she talked about last week. 
So to give you an overview of what we plan to talk about, uh, we're going to start by discussing um, what is single cell um, in relation to the HCA. So this will relate back to what was discussed last week by Kirsten. Um, then we will give you um, some more information about single cell methodology, look into alternative technologies. Um, then we'll discuss 10X. So 10X is mostly what we do in our lab at present. Um, so we can discuss that in more detail. And then we plan to give you an overview of how to make a 10X library. We'll then move into spatial work. And then if there's time, we're happy to take questions. So the um, Human Cell Atlas, as uh, was discussed last week by, um, by Kirsten, um, currently has sequenced over 121,000 cells. It has over 3,000 members. Um, and as of the end of 2018, had um, funding and successfully completed 410 projects using over 26 tissues. So what is single cell? So to recap, because I understand Kirsten showed a slide um, with her fruit bowl and smoothie analogy. So this is similar, only um, it's just from a different angle. So as we all know, plants have multiple different functions. They have multiple different tissues. You have your petals, you have your leaves, you have your stalks, which you can break down into individual flowers. So for instance, this orchid has leaves, stem, flowers. The tulip has the same, but it's all effectively a whole organ. So if you loop this back to um, human tissue, this would be the equivalent of a whole organ. So like the lungs or the heart or a tumor organ. So if you were gonna do um, profiling on this, you'd be looking at the whole thing. So effectively bulk profiling. Now we're able to do, um, to look at the individual components. So um, the petals, the leaves, the individual flowers, and like with the tulip, the flower head and the leaf. So this is uh, allows us to do uh, profiled single cells and look at the individual components. So in this case, this is single cell profiling, just in a different example, but the same idea. So leading into the same thing. So if you look at bulk RNA sequencing, you have your heterogeneous tissue, um, which then leads into total RNA or cDNA, which if you sequence, you'd end up with bulk expression data. Um, so you see the whole the whole profile from the whole thing, as opposed to the individual components. So if you look at, you can see there's a change in gene X, but you don't know um, what caused that change. So there's no change of expression. We just know that gene X is present. Whereas if you look at um, it from a single cell angle, you then see the single cell barcoded cDNA comes out of the heterogeneous tissue, which when sequenced, you can then cluster into cell types and different genes. And Whilst you get the same outcome with gene X, you also can see that with cell type B, the expression of gene X is actually affected only in cell type B. This isn't something that's possible with bulk sequencing. This is one of the many advantages that we see here. So to recap, single cell RNA sequencing, you'd start with your tissue or your tumor. You'd isolate and sequence the individual cells. Um, you have your individual genes that come out of that, which you can then look at read counts, individual UMIs. Um, and then you have your genes to cells output uh, graphs, and you can look at different types of cell type and feed this into like standard um, analysis software such as SCAMPI. So if we look at the exponential growth in single cell data over the years, if we look originally, we started in with manual, and then we were into multiplexing, uh, microfluidics, through into robotics, and now we're into things like picogram, pico wells, and in situ barcoding, you know, injecting tiny things into tiny cells. Um, so if we look back to say 2013, we were just leaving the days of SmartSeq behind and moving into Fluidyme. SmartSeq 2 was coming around and 10X Genomics landed in 2016. So now we've got things like SplitSeq. Further technologies um, moving on from here that we also work with are things like PipSeq. So the PipSeq single cell kit provides cell capture and library preparation reagents to generate sequencing ready libraries for three prime um, gene expression profiling. So you start from a single cell suspension and it's over a two day workflow. It's really convenient. So these libraries enable you to profile up to 20,000 individual cells per sample and are compatible with Illumina next gen sequencing instruments. Potentially this could replace 10X depending. We, we've not done that much testing with it, but if it's cheaper, if it's easier relative to cost, it may be something that could, could move on and you know, become more, more of a bigger deal in our lab. We also work with a company called Scale Bio um, that works with fixed samples. So 
the benefits there are that you can plan the work in the lab rather than having to process everything fresh. So you can have a plan for the day. You can come in, know exactly what you're doing. Whereas the problem with fresh tissue is it turns up when it, whenever it turns up and you have to literally drop everything and, and process straight away. So scale bio is also plate-based. It's a barcoding technology. It needs 12 samples to generate a million cells as an output. We also have an in-house um, technology that's been developed um, using cholesterol modified oligos which allows you to multiplex samples of the same genotype and then deconvolute using downstream analysis software. This is based on an inserted barcode as part of the CMO. It was designed by one of our staff scientists. This is another technology that we have had a um, handle on in the lab. It's PARS Biosciences. So this goes from cDNA generation through to library. It uses fixed cells. So it's another new angle which allows all the advantages of using frozen material. It's it works on split pool barcoding so it has a very slight three prime bias but it's mainly whole transcript so there's various stages so with the fixation you lock in the gene expression immediately after sample collection um, with a really rapid fixation program after that you can either store them for up to six months or proceed directly to barcoding then you have your barcode library prep sequence step um which is more manual in terms of plate-based handling because you split, then you pull, you pull it together in a reservoir, you split it out into a plate and you repeat multiple times. This third three times. So the third round of barcoding. Um, it is a lot more manual and, and it's more ergonomically demanding. So in our view, to run this at scale, you would need to use automation. So with the barcoding, you attach barcodes to each transcript by progressing cells through the split pool combinatory barcoding, as I said. The kit proceeds to a standard library prep to generate sequencing ready bond molecules. With regarding the sequencing, the resulting libraries are sequenced by next gen sequencing. So nothing special there. And the PARS's computational pipeline generates an interactive report for rapid insights. So all their outputted files, including this gene cell count matrix at the bottom, um, integrate seamlessly with existing open source tools such as Scampi. So um, if we look at what um, single cell sequencing methods actually involve. So single cell RNA-seq is most useful um, if the cells have different functions. So examples of this would include working on the work on the thymus that the lab does. So looking at the presence of T and B cell receptors, TCRs and BCRs immune cells to determine specificity of different cells within the organ being studied. We also have people working on developmental biology, on neuronal biology using brainstem and multiome. Uh, we also have people working on brain function and looking at the effects on the body. So, as you know, damaging one part of the brain can lead to a completely different part of the body being affected. For example, if you damage one part of the brain through a stroke or brain bleed, it could lead to paralysis. Whereas that, that's just not something that happens to any other part of the body. But similarly, although the brain cells look similar, they have very different functions. So VDJ profiling, chromium single cell immune profiling provides a comprehensive approach to simultaneously examine cellular heterogeneity of the immune system. So T and B cell repertoire diversity, antigen specificity at single cell uh, resolution. We also do single cell attack seek based on transposase mediated insertion of sequencing primers into open chromatin regions. So this assay, um, like the traditional attack seek, provides profiles of open and accessible regions of chromatin that are indicative of active regulatory regions of single cell resolution. This we'll talk about later. And then multiome, we also do um, in the lab um, that allows you to simultaneously profile both the gene expression and the open chromatin um, to examine the cellular heterogeneity of the immune system. So T and B cell repertoire diversity, antigen specificity at single cell resolution. Um, you can multiply um, your power of discovery to characterize cell types and states and uncover gene regulatory programs. So if we look at the power of single cell RNA-seq as an actual example, um, it allows us to compare healthy and disease samples, for example, Crohn's disease. So this is work performed in our lab, looking at the developing gut in pediatric samples obtained from a variety of sources. So the Crohn's patients show compositional changes in epithelial cells with more of the undifferentiated cell types um, seen. So there are more of the transit amplifying cells, which are these guys, the TAs, um, seen in the patients with Crohn's. 
It's understood that when stem cells divide, they're believed to undergo asymmetric cell division. So you have a new stem cell plus a committed daughter cell. These rapidly cycling daughter cells, also called transit amplifying or TA cells, um, then undergo a limited number of cell divisions before terminally differentiating into a tissue mass. So this can lead into the altered intestinal epithelial cell dynamics seen in regenerating Crohn's. Looking at this um, figure here, E, which is out of one of our papers, we can see that certain markers are more expressed in fetal and developmental stages and inactive Crohn's, supporting the view that an altered epithelial dynamics can lead to the reactivation of the developmental transcriptional pathways. The arrows underneath point to genes discussed in the paper. Red is genes that have previously been linked to proliferation and black is genes linked to inflammation and or development. The non-inflamed Crohn's disease example is a group of patients with minimal epithelial changes, i.e. those, so these guys here, not in an active flare-up. Whereas um, all this work on Crohn's disease and other gut cells um, are all due to be published as part of a gut atlas paper um, by our lab. So for changing gear, so I'm just going to go through with a uh, general overview of the single cell sequencing um, uh, process. So it, I, I mean, initially you're starting with a tissue, a tissue uh, dis dissection. So you just need to remove your um, wanted part of the tissue from the you know, whole organ. And then you go with the cell dissociation. So it could be um, with enzymatic uh, or mechanical dissociation. So depending on what, what you're trying to do. And then you, that eventually you get in, um, obtain the single uh, cell suspension. So then, then you can do a filtering. So using the appropriate size filtering, depending on what type of tissues you're trying to retain. And if you want to retain the smaller size of cells, you, need, you can use a slightly bigger filtering uh, techniques to do that. And then af after that, you can do a, optionally, you can do a, a cells can be selected. It could be using um, FAX, which is the, uh, for, uh, uh, fluorescently uh, labeled antibodies to specifically label cells based on their presence on or absence of their um, certain cell surface markers. And then you can use the uh, laser detection um, and then use the fluorescence to uh, sort the cells, um, cells of your interest. And then from each individu individual cells, so we are extracting RNA and then do the reverse transcription um, to make a cDNA from it. And then the, once you've done the cDNA, you need to generate enough mass to do the library preparation. So the, once you've done the, uh, that, so you can use um, li uh, library preparation by you, uh, adding some sequencing adapters into that. And then it, it get uh, sequenced usually with paired and Illumina sequencing and because it's a short read sequencing. And then you get the uh, the genes by cell count matrix as a raw data, and there will be uh, uh, several downstream analysis using bioinformatics tools to um, identify your um, genes of interest and then uh, interrogate data to um, uh, get more uh, depth understanding of the cell biology. So in here, so I'm just just briefly. Uh, mentioned couple of techniques that were available. So there are multiple other techniques available as well. So for instance, like a three prime end, uh, sequencing three prime def, end of the transcript or the five prime end of the transcript or the multi uh, approach. So three prime end of the transcript. So if you do it, so you can, it's a you're sequencing the three prime end of the transcript and it's it's useful to identify you know, and um, and quantify your RNA transcript in, and also uh, look, you can find the location of the transcription termination site. For instance, uh, the five prime, so that helps to um, sequence the TCR or BCR receptors in immune cells. So that is useful to study the transcription start site and the promoter usage and transcription initiation, initiation events. The, again, so these are only few techniques available, but there are all the, the techniques that you're gonna use, it's all depend on your biological question and your input material. So 
in here, so this is a one technique that we're using in the lab. So this is a chromium single cell multium ATEC and gene expression. So this is a 10x uh, platform. So this combines two modalities. So together, so that's uh, gene expression and the chromatin accessibility in the same cell. So why single cell se nuclear sequence is um, useful? Uh, because uh, that could be useful for tissues that don't dissociate well. And also it allows capture of cells that would normally die during the dissociation. And also it works well with the frozen tissues and cells and OCT blocks. So that means you can actually plan your day as Laura mentioned earlier. So you can actually plan the, um, your experiment uh, beforehand. And the ATEC is um, like a is called as uh, assay for transposes accessible chromatin so that capture the information on chrom open chromatin region so the open chromatin region normally associate with regulatory elements such as promoters and enhancers which are important for gene expression regulation so in briefly the uh, chromium single cell multium and gene expression provides a comprehensive scalable approach for simultaneous profiling epigenetic landscape and also the gene expression in the same nuclei. To achieve that, so we need to have a transposes, transposed nuclei. So how are you gonna achieve the transposed nuclei? So for that, we use the uh, uh, transposes enzyme, TN5 enzyme, and then incubate the TN5 enzyme in with the nuclear suspension. So the transposes enter the nuclei and preferentially fragment the DNA in open chromatin region. And it's simulta simultaneously at the sequencing adapters at the each end of the DNA fragments. And also you can see on the uh, on the image, there's a 10X bar, a 10X bead is uh, on, the, on the right hand corner. So that's the 10X barcode gel bead contains poly DT barcode. So which helps to capture the um, and uh, capture and production of the full length cDNA from polyadenylated mRNA. That's for the gene expression library preparation. And also there's a spacer sequence. So that enables barcode att attachment to the transposed nuclei fragments. That's for ATAC library generation. Once you have a transposed nuclei and then you, uh, and that master mix loaded together in a chromium uh, microfluidic chip with 10x gel beads and then partitioning oil. Inside the chromium controller, there's a microfluidic chip generates um, droplet called gems, gel bead in emulsion. So the so that um, that means you are, get the nuclei get partitioned into a nanoliter um, partition uh, gel beads, and then inside um, most gems contain only a gel bead. And then there's some of the uh, subset of beads, uh, some, some subset of uh, uh, gems contain single nuclei as well. So the ones you pre prepare the uh, single, uh, this is, you can see on the on the screen, so you can, that's how you, uh, nuclear uh, suspension and gel beads sent through the nuclear um, chip J um, microfluidic controller. And then once you prepare your, um, your gems, the uh, gems bead get dissolved, releasing the all the uh, barcodes for the sequence uh, spacer barcode and the uh, poly DT barcode. So within the gem, you have DNA fragments for from open chromatin um, region to capture open chromatin region, and also you can you have the uh, poly DT barcode and the spacer sequence and your uh, uh, mRNA and the DNA fragments from the uh, open chromatin region. Once you once the gems get incubated, you will produce 10X barcode DNA fragments from the open chromatin region and also the barcoded mRNA uh, from the uh, barcoded cDNA from your mRNA. And then there'll be a pre-amplification step to produce uh, enough uh, material for the library construction. So the, this pre-amplified product will be is used as your input material for both your a ATAC library construction and also the CDNA amplification uh, um, leads to the gene expression library construction. 
uh, once you get the sequences done, so you all the t 10x barcodes in each library type. So you can imagine there's a all each cell will have a 10x barcode attached. So these 10 10x barcode in each library type are used to associate individual sequencing reads back to the individual partition, then thereby each individual individual nucleus. So for the QC, so for to, before we submit any libraries to the sequencing, so we need to QC. So there are two different QC uh, practices that we're using within the lab. So one is using uh, Agilent Bioanalyzer and the other one is a tape station. The Bioanalyzer usually use um, microfluidic technology to perform the high resolution electrophoresis and the fluorescent based detection. And the other hand, the tape station is gel electrophoresis. So the separation channels based on the, the, the samples get separated using their, uh, on their sizes. The, se the, the separations happen within the gel matrix. So how the, then once you've done your amplifications, you will get, initially you get cDNA for before you make a gene expression library. So, so DNA trace is like a graphical representation of the electrophoretic separation of the cDNA fragments. So you can see your um, cDNA, there's a quite low concentr um, concentrated, but by all, uh, all depends as compared to your primer dimer peak. So you can see there's a primer dimer peak in the beginning, so which which is unwanted. If you you can sequence this one, but if you sequence this one, so you're gonna waste, waste your sequencing facility because there's a big uh, primer dimer peak is gonna get sequenced. So to remove that, so you have a clean up. So we use this beads called spry bead. So they are solid phase reversible immobilization magnetic beads. The, the, the beads be only become magnetic when, when it's the magnetic field. So, and also we can use this uh, beads to size select as well. So depending on the ratio of uh, spry beads to your sample, so different sizes of fragments can be isolated. And you can see when you, if you do a second cleanup using the spry bleed, beads, so you can even get rid of your primer dimer peak. And also you can see your cDNAs are more skewed towards the high, uh, high molecular weight fragments. This is what we need for the um, right library preparation. So, and the, for example, you can see on the good quality uh, cDNA, how it generally should look like. Um, and then this, you can see there's a flat line cDNA peak, which is uh, your samples fail. You need to be, uh, you need to repeat that. So I can just briefly explain to you about the, how the ATAC libraries look like on the um, QC. So ATAC is like QC shows like a periodicity of the nucleosome winding. So there's generally, so there are four peaks should be seen. So the first one is like a um, no nucleosome and then the second, and then and the mononucleosome and the dinucleosome and the multinucleosome. So these peaks occurs a frequency of 150 to 180 base pairs that's that is concordant with the uh, length of DNA wrapped around in each nucleosome. The, um, the intensity of the peak, the, uh, the intensity of the peak, ATAC peak, is the uh, relative abundance of the accessible chromatin in that genomic regions, and also it has um, it's high peak in intensity indicates there's a greater accessibility of the region that's suggesting there's a functional significance on in term of, in terms of gene regulation also so th this peak intensity could be varied depending on your sample type and the nuclear load and also the platform that you're using and then once you get this uh, sequencing data from ATAC so there are ATAC peak calling algorithms to identify and annotate the locations of peak on ATAC seq data and this is a, a gene expression library look like for the QC. It is also a graphical representation of the size distribution of uh, DNA fragments within the library. It's important to ensure the library is high quality and suitable for sequencing. Um, it is a collection of DNA fragments 
and also uh, if there's a uh, irregularities or anomalies in the tra uh, trace indicates issue, issues such as degradation or contamination or any incomplete uh, library preparation. So usually you should see a peak around the 400 base pairs region uh, and also the maximum and the minimum uh, region selection should be 200 to 1000 base pairs. That is compatible with Illumina sequencing. Um, so the if you see any additional peaks within this region, you sh should clean it up. So again, so you can use the spray beads. Uh, as I said, it's a it's a size selection bead. So you can use the ratio of the beads to sample to size select and to get rid of the uh, uh, unwanted peaks. And if the sample is too concentrated, for inst instance, if it's more than 100 uh, nanomole, uh, mole, and then that needs to be diluted before submitting to sequencing. So like with everything, there are always drawbacks um, and there are things that are required in order to ensure that you have the highest quality output. So for single cell approaches to work, you need to have the highest possible um, quality input with your sample. So you need intact and viable cells. You need to minimize stress um, on the cells through your methodology. Um, and you also need to ensure that your degradation, the amount of loss and death through the protocol um, is kept to a minimum. So what is the issue with using tissue? So different cells in a tissue can react differently to the same conditions. So what works for one type of sample cell, um, cell composite cell you're looking for may not work for all of them. So depending on what your output you're looking for, that may affect how and what you use in order to do your dissociation. So in order to do the dissociation, you could do it either enzymatically or mechanically. Um, both will obviously introduce a certain degree of stress to the sample and could again be biased. Um, but with all dissociation, you need to ensure it's done in a way that maintains the RNA integrity. So what are the issues with single cell approaches? So um, the main issue from our perspective is the fact that you start with such a small amount of material. So if you're then looking for a rare type of, of cell, like one of our researchers is, then it's even harder because you're already starting with a low input. And time you've done multiple rounds of facts, uh, washing, staining with different antibodies, sorting, um, you can be left with very little, unless, of course, you know, it happens to go really, really well that day, and then you may get a beautiful library, which, you know, also does occur. Um, so in a lot of cases, in all cases, in fact, you need to use PCR um, post um, cDNA generation in order to produce your library or and to do the, also to generate the cDNA. So that can introduce um, bias, um, whilst also increasing the molecular number. Like everything comes with its own caveats. Every experimental step is associated with loss, um, such as centrifugation, um, staining, fact sorting, everything. Um, data sets do tend to be generally sparse, so you need to profile many cells. So what, what are the possible solutions to some of these issues? So if you want to use fresh samples, then ideally processing tissue as quickly and as gently as possible is your number one priority. You can also use tissue preservation techniques such as cold preservation, i.e. hypothermosol at four degrees. So we've done um, tissue stability studies that have shown that you can store tissue for up to 72 hours with minimal um, degradation. You can also preserve um, quickly cold preservation such as flash freezing or OCT. Um, these examples will need protocol adjustments for single nuclear approaches to work. And also fixation of tissue, will they feed into one of the methods mentioned earlier, such as PARS, um, or the 10x RNA hybridization kit? Right. Um, now that we all looked at the single cell approaches, I will discuss very briefly what are the spatial transcriptomic methods that we use at Sanger. So as complicated as the word sounds, uh, spatial transcriptomics is a method for assigning cell types to their locations in the histological sections. This method can be used to determine the subcellular localization of mRNA molecules. Our first step is to cut very thin sections, usually around five microns, and stain them with hematoxylin and eosin stain, which is the most commonly used histological stain by the pathologist, which allows us to visualize the nuclei in purple, as you can see in the figure, and the cytoplasmic components in pink. So once we completed the tissue morphological assessment, we can proceed with any of these spatial transcriptomic techniques that are list listed here. 
uh, to determine the location of different cell types in the tissue section. So I will go through very briefly what are the techniques, so RNA scope and immunohistochemistry, incident sequencing, 10x protocols that we do for fresh frozen and FFPE tissue, and rare site orion for protein staining, and finally, 3D reconstruction of the timers that we've done. So to begin with RNA scope and immunohistochemistry. So RNA scope and IHC are commonly used techniques to validate single cell data, to visualize the exact spatial location of genes and proteins of interest in the tissue section. We can use either chromogenic or fluorescent tissue uh, detection for RNA biomarkers. Here, I've used uh, fluorescent, biomar uh, flu fluorescent detection uh, each spot, each dot represent an individual RNA molecule. So the key benefit of the RNA scope is the high sensitivity and high specificity. Usually we can do it both manually and automated. However, the automated one is far easier to use. We use automated Leica Bond RX machine for high throughput RNA scope staining. At Sango, we usually run three to four plex. As you can see in the figure, this is what we've done for lung three plex. And uh, we can also perform high plex RNA scope, as you can see in the figure below, which has like loads of different, different colors. And uh, this is mouse brain high plex uh, using 12 colors done by one of our teams. However, it can be quite time consuming and costly as also the cell segmentation and the spot configuration can be quite challenging. So this is another technique called in situ sequencing, which is also known as ISS. Uh, this technology enables the analysis of hundreds of genes with subcellular resolution at their original location in morphologically preserved tissue sections. Usually we use formaldehyde or paraformaldehyde for fixation. Here is an example we did with the Cartana ISS kit for fetal limb tissue. You can see like different cell types in uh, gene um, expression in uh, different colors. So different colors correspond to different targeted genes in the panel. Uh, on your right is the mouse brain tissue that we use for 150 targeted genes using the Cartana ISS kit. So moving on to the 10X Visium. So usually we do this protocol for fresh frozen and FFPE tissue sections. And 10X Visium enables to map the whole transcriptome for the entire tissue section. This technology is compatible with diverse set of organs across different species, including mouse, rat, uh, and you can obtain high cellular resolution. So 10X Visium combines histological and gene expression data with easy to use software. Um, and also we use rare site Orion platform for multiplex protein staining. Similar to the other methods we discussed previously, we use rare site Orion platform to visualize the proteins of interest in the tissue sections. We perform 12 to 16 plex panels of antibodies on different tissue sections. Here I have shown you a, a pediatric timer sections we used, um, we stained using 14 plex immuno-oncology panel. And um, to sum up, uh, I've shown you here, I thought this would be quite fascinating to see. We've been looking at 2D images so far. So we are also currently working on 3D tissue reconstruction and also tissue clearing and 3D imaging, which is quite fascinating. I can guarantee you in, in the future, there'll be loads of more exciting 3D images using human tissue, which would provide powerful insight for cancer diagnostics. So watch the space, it's ever evolving, evolving. So on that note, I would like to thank our PI, Dr. Sarah Teichman, and all the wet lab uh, people in the Teichman lab, and Lira, who was one of the staff um, scientists, and all the Selgen wet lab team, support team. And thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we appreciate the time that you've taken to yeah, participate in the seminar series. Uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to ask so thank, thank you so much that was just a, a brilliant you know a really nice flow of uh, uh, talks and it, it was th thank you so much for preparing all that and taking all the time to do uh, this uh, so do, do we have any questions any questions from the audience yes dinuka yes go ahead dinuka 
Um, hi, uh, first of all, thank you so much. That was uh, really, really interesting. And um, it's quite eye-opening uh, uh, for us. Um, so I, um, I just have a quick question. I'm not uh, overly familiar with like pathology and histology, but is there a minimum tissue size you need for say something like in-situ sequencing? I'm just curious. I think yeah, there's no minimum tissue si size as far as you can fit the tissue section on the, uh, the glass slide. Right. You know, the Leica microscope glass slide, then it's fine. Like you can kind of like draw a circle around the area that you would like to stain using like a pap pen or something so that you don't have to stain the whole slide, but you can kind of targetly, you know, only stain a certain area of interest. But as far as it fits in the um, microscopic slide, then that, that would be absolutely fine. Whereas VCM and other technologies has capture areas. So you have to be specific with how how much, like how big your tissue section are. But what you can do is like, if, you're, if your region of interest is very small, you can kind of like section appropriately so that you can get your region of interest onto the capture area and then you can perform any of these techniques but iss you can do um the whole slide that's fine okay so um so uh, you you were talking about um how like if you're, if you're using sort of tissue sections it's uh, sometimes subject to um you, you know the dissociation it can affect different cells and and is that that's sort of a drawback, isn't it? So I was, I was just wondering, um, in something like single cell RNA sequencing, is it relatively easier to do uh, cells like, say, lymphocytes, for example, rather than um, a tissue section, or is it comparable? I'm j just just curious. Um, so we do do all different types of tissue, and we do different types of cells. Um, if we get tissue samples, say from the hospital then we do often look for um, lymphocytes. You can do lymphocyte staining, um, which will help you to identify them and capture them lower down, um, you know, capture them when you do your library prep. So yeah, it's perfectly feasible. Um, it depends what we're doing. If we just take a fresh sample um, and just prepare it for loading it for 10X, that's quite straightforward. It gets more complicated when you want to do nuclei and or multiome has more level layers to it. But yes, as a, in theory, yes, it's quite straightforward. So we right. do uh, you have an uh, enrichment strategy, such yeah. like a CD45 enrichment to okay. uh, enrich your like, site, so actually you can um, target those cells. Right. Um, is is there a difference if you're sort of selecting cells using, say, fax or max? Um, I mean, is there yeah. something? Yeah, fax is like um, more, if you need more purity, the fax is much better. Okay. So you can target more, much more. But the uh, the max is more magnetic activated. It's more, it's quite simple, easy to use as well. Yeah. And it's cost effective as well. So it's only, you cannot, you can, you cannot uh, differentiate. You can only do a one or two, uh, not many enrichments. You cannot separate so many. But in fact, you can do so many. You can do a neg negative um, isolation. You can do a positive isolation. You can do a different staining to isolate different uh, clusters of cells of interest. So that's more precise as well. Right. So yeah. if you were doing a fax, is, uh, is that um, sort of like a, like a minimum time period between when you sort of uh, sort the cells and it, does that have to undergo like a culturing and resting period before you attempt? Uh, uh, um, no, no, because normally we, we stain uh, with your dye, like uh, we use uh, 7 AAD, it's like uh, antibody, so you just basically can... Okay staying with but for 10 minutes and then it's ready to go on the on the fax so again it depends on the your uh the cell population if it's a very rare cell population it might take a longer on the fax machine because it has has to go through so many um uh, so you have to uh, feed them in quite slowly right okay got it thank you thank you very much do we have any more questions In that, that case, thank you so much. I think that was a brilliant, uh, you know, uh, 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 lecture and, uh, I mean, series of, 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 from the three of you. And uh, uh, thank you for answering our questions. So we are looking forward to the next lecture uh, uh, on Thursday. Uh, so see all of you then. So thank you and a pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.